that's good. So this is just to give them the timing of my slides. I'm a bit of a control freak with my PowerPoints. And uh, so, oh, wait a bit. Let me just stop this being a law unto itself. Um, uh, okay. Um, so I'm going to do a session this morning that introduces both what I'm going to be doing with the uh, gap year students in the morning and with whoever comes in the evenings. So this is kind of a, like a launch pad for two different um, tracks we're going to follow during the week. And the topic is the big story of the kingdom of God. Uh, and what I'm trying to do here is get the whole of our understanding and theology of the kingdom and make it into one one. Uh, story. So, movements like Church of the Nations and the Vineyard that I come from have been born in an era of church history that is reflecting a major revolution that has happened in the gospel we preach and the theology we believe in. And so, I want to explain that. Um, my one book there is called The Kingdom Reformation, where I'm trying to articulate this. So, up until recent times, most theology in the church has been called what is called systematic theology. And it goes back to the creeds that were formed in the second to the fourth century, you know, the Apostles' Creed, I believe in God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And theologians used to take the creed and try to expound it and do doctrines like a systematic theology book would have a doctrine of God, a doctrine of Christ, a doctrine of salvation, and a chapter on each. And that has really been how theology has happened for millennia. And that's fine. The only problem, though, is that books like that tend to start with the chapter they want to write, and they go and find verses all over the Bible, often out of context, to serve the particular doctrine they are expounding. In more recent times, there has emerged what is called biblical theology. Biblical theology is where the writers stay inside the biblical books and the thinking and words of the biblical writers. It, it runs much closer to the biblical text itself. And out of that has come in even more recent times what is called narrative theology that reflects the fact that the vehicle God has used to communicate to us is the story of Scripture, the great story of the kingdom. And the kingdom theology we are into today has come out of that development. And in the long span of church history, this is really a very recent phenomenon, the last 80 to 100 years. It represents a, a sea shift, a, a tremendous change that has happened in the whole body of Christ. And so the critical thing is, how do we get to really tell the story of the kingdom the way the Bible tells the story. And that means reading the Bible with certain lenses, with a narrative reading of the Bible. So this is a development that has happened in the last 80 to 100 years, and it links to a huge shift in culture, which is the shift from modernism to postmodernism. And just very simply, modernism is the enlightenment the period in European history where, you know, the leaders of thought were great rationalists and elevated science, and everything was very much into um, propositions and definitions. And out of that, you get doctrines that are trying to very carefully list uh, all the points of a doctrine. <laughs> Postmodernism, which has really happened in the Second World War and onwards in history. Uh, and that is where the gap year students and what we call uh, 
the millennial generation and the Gen Z generation. Those are people now in their teens and 20s and 30s. They don't think so much in doctrines and formula, but they resonate far more with stories and with the narrative way of thinking. And so it's really interesting that the kingdom of God understanding has come as the world, it's, it's very contemporary and relevant, if you like. And there are a lot of disciplines today, whether it's sociology or psychology or education, that'll tell us that stories, or maybe more technically worldviews, are what humans live in and what helps us shape our identity. We, we define ourselves by stories. So for instance, my story, my parents, my father was a fighter pilot, he got shot down, he escaped, he got into Switzerland, he met my mother, they fell in love, they got married. I should never have been born. So many reasons he should have died. And my identity comes out of that story. There's a book he wrote about it, it's very exciting. I say that I grew up with Indians and Zulus and Natal, you know, I could speak English like a Indian fellow when I was a little fellow. And and all the stories of Shaka and all of that identify who I am as a South African today. So when the Springboks are beating up other teams and I'm screaming, it's because of the story I inhabit. See, and other people from other countries have their stories. And it's very much what identifies us. But of course, the greatest storyteller ever was Jesus. He didn't go around formulating doctrines. He told stories. He told parables. The sower and the seed, and, and, you know, and every one of them, he begins by saying, this is what the kingdom of God is like. And then he tells a story. Uh, and thousands of people came and spent all day listening to him. Um, partly because of the signs and wonders, but partly because he was such a great storyteller. And the story about Jesus is the greatest story that's ever been told. And so that's what we are into. And what is becoming very apparent now with narrative theology is that narrative or story is the vehicle God has used to communicate to us. The story of Israel, the story of Jesus, and the ongoing story of world missions. That is what it's all about. And that is what the kingdom of God is all about. That is what our theology is all about. And so again, the whole question is, what then is the story? How can we tell it in a compelling and clear way? And to start doing that, we start with Jesus. You know, you were singing all the songs this morning, it's about Jesus. A hermeneutical key simply means the lens you put on when you study something. And so people have read the Bible in all sorts of ways through history. Today, we read the Bible with Jesus' lenses, with how he understood the scriptures. And so uh, it's not very difficult to show that the most frequent phrase on the lips of Jesus was the kingdom of God. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. He has a parable about the kingdom of God. It's just statistically all through the gospels. It's very clear that that was his major mission and message and theme. For him, of course, his Bible was the Old Testament. And so how, did, how do we take that Jesus key and use it to unlock the Old Testament. And what we find is the Old Testament is the story of Yahweh on his throne where he dwells in the fire and the cloud between the cherubim on the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant, which is his throne, in the temple or the tabernacle, which symbolizes the cosmos. So he is the great king of the universe. And it's the whole story of the kingship of God. And then the subtext under that is that he made us male and female in his image 
And twice it says in Genesis chapter 1, he made them in his image and he said, rule over nature. And so humanity was made to be God's vice regents. God is the great king, and we are supposed to be the little kings who, on his behalf, rule his creation. And the big question is, how have we done with that mandate? I think humanity basically has messed it up. But now there's a, there's a story of God bringing us back to his original purpose. So how does the story run through Scripture? And I'm going to use a, a concept here that I'll explain to you. The word chiasm, or chiasm, depending on how you want to pronounce it, comes from the Greek word ex, laid on its side. And the biblical writers habitually thought in terms of chiasms. And the way a chiasm works is that the outer extremities correspond. A corresponds to A. And then the next layer in, B corresponds to B. And then C corresponds to C. But always it is the center that is the focal point. The story moves towards a center and the story progresses from that center. And the whole story of the kingdom looks like this. God made us as the great king to be his representatives and to extend his glory over all creation. It's a story of our vocation. And it's a story that begins from creation and ends in new creation. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to work out Genesis 1 and 2 is about creation. End of the book of Revelation, there's a new heaven and a new earth. There is a new creation. So the whole story runs from creation to new creation. The story of creation is linked to humanity because we are there to rule nature on God's behalf. And, of course, the fall of man means that we messed it up. But God's purpose is to create a new humanity where... In the book of Revelation, it says, I saw a great company from every nation, tribe, and tongue, and language standing before the throne. And you have a new humanity which unleashes a new creation. And only that can bring about the new creation. But what happened with humanity is humanity rebelled against God. And you get the climax of that in the story of the Tower of Babel. And so God chose the nation of Israel to take the place of humanity, and hopefully to do for humanity what humanity had failed to do. And the scripture drives to the moment when there will be a new humanity. But what happened in the story of Israel is even Israel failed. So for a while under David and Solomon, the kingdom of God came, but then they started worshiping idols, and God had to send them into exile, and then the idea was that maybe through the suffering of the exile, a purified remnant of Israel would fulfill the purpose of God. But eventually you find the story is even the remnant fails. Till eventually there is one person who in the Old Testament language is called the son of man from Daniel or the servant of Yahweh, the suffering servant in Isaiah. You know that passage, he was wounded for our transgression, he was bruised. And the, and the servant embodies the nation and does what the nation failed to do. And the whole of humanity's destiny eventually revolves around what happens in Jesus. And he turns it, every, he turns it around, he turns the whole story around. And then from there we have this expansion. And the, the symbolic figures are very important. Jesus chose 12 disciples. He was forming the new nation of Israel. He then expanded it to 70, or 72 if you're reading Luke. And that was the number of all the nations in the table of nations in Genesis 11. So it is the new people of God once again for all the nations of the earth. And um, is it going? All right, well, 
Should I get undressed? I think so. Leave it on, leave it on, but the, the box, turn off the box. Yeah, I'm just going to let it hang. I'll get partly undressed, all right? Um, all right, is that all right? Okay. 120 on the day of Pentecost, that was the number needed to form a ruling body or a Sanhedrin. So Jesus put in place this new people of God. And then, of course, we know from the book of Acts, 3,000 got converted, and then 5,000 got converted, and then they couldn't count anymore, and the worldwide church was born. And we now live in the part of the story where the new people of God is reaching all of humanity so that the purpose of God can climax where there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And that's how the narrative, the story of the kingdom moves through Scripture. On top of that, there's another major way that the Bible writers thought. And that was of two ages. This age, which in the Hebrew is called Haolam Hazeh, an age of man's fallenness, of paganism, of, of world rulers that oppress humanity, a time of darkness and bondage. And eventually there will come what is called the day of judgment or the end, the eschatos, where God will terminate this fallen world. And then there will come a coming age called the haolam ha Haolam Haba, the, the, the world to come, the scenes of the book of Revelation, where the former things have passed away and God has made all things new. The miraculous, unexpected, and amazing thing that occurred in Jesus is that in his life and ministry, in his death, in his resurrection, in his ascension, the powers of that future world broke into the present, and the new creation started to be get, get displayed in front of us. So you watch Jesus driving out demons and healing the sick and ministering to the poor, and you see the beginning of the new world that is coming. And supremely in his death and resurrection, you see the new world that is coming. And so the result is now there are two types of human beings. There's homo sapiens, fallen humanity, and then there is the new humanity. I'd say that we are homo christianoi. We are a new species of human beings born again by the Spirit. And our calling now is to reach all of humanity so that there can come a new heaven and a new earth. So basically, the narrative is about two stories in the Scriptures. Today, it's about the ongoing story of world missions, the story of Israel and the story of Jesus. And the story of Israel moves in ever-growing visions of the coming kingdom, the kingdom of God coming in the Mosaic era, the kingdom of God coming in the Davidic era, and then the com coming of the kingdom in the visions of the future in the great prophets of Israel. And then the story in Jesus, the story the life of Jesus and his ministry, the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, and the ascension of Jesus. And the way the story of Israel relates to the story of Jesus is promise and fulfillment. The Old Testament is like one gigantic growing promise. One day God's kingdom will come in Jesus. Now the kingdom of God starts to break through into time and into history. Now, just to be clear that I'm not inventing my own story, how, do we, how can we be sure that the biblical story is all about creation and new creation? So I'm just going to give you a couple of texts that show you this is the way the biblical writers and Jesus himself thought. So Jesus says, I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, etc., that phrase, Everything is moving to the renewal of all things. Or the early disciples asked Jesus, raised from the dead, Lord, will you, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Put everything back the way it was supposed to be. Or Peter's sermon talks about how Jesus has ascended and he will return. 
And heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything. See, this is God's purpose, is to put right everything in his creation. Or in Peter, he talks about how we are waiting for a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. And then at the end of the book of Revelation, you see a new heaven and a new earth. So it's very clear, this is the framework of the whole story of Scripture. So everything we do today is always living inside this story. This is the architecture within which we move around the furniture. And so whether you're preaching or in a life group or witnessing to a friend or ministering to somebody, you are always living in the story. And the thing is to know how to live in the story. And so we need to, first of all, learn how to tell the story. I've tried to tell the whole story just this morning in one shot, okay? And so often we can get lost in the details. We need to see the grandeur and the simplicity of this whole story from beginning to end. And we can't download the whole story every time we're witnessing to somebody. Um, what we do is the Holy Spirit leads us to to select one part of the story, maybe Jesus' miracles, or maybe Jesus' death, or maybe Jesus' resurrection. That we must let the Holy Spirit, or, or when, it, when you're preaching, we must let the Holy Spirit lead us. But we must never forget that whatever little bit of it we're telling, we know the big story. And we are going to fit the part of it we're telling into the big story of God and his kingdom. And we need to retell the story amongst ourselves again and again. You must never think that because you've done a series on the kingdom of God in your church that all the people got it. Don't ever assume that. We have to retell the story over and over again. And we need to, when I say massage it, we need to, I think you know what I mean. We need to let it distill into everything we do, whether it's with new believers or new members or young adults or emerging leaders or gap year students, we've got to get the story into our people. And every part of the story of Jesus must become part of our lives. So it's not just that this is a story that's outside of us like history that we can look at as though it's there and we are here. Every part of the story of Jesus needs to be ministered to us by the Holy Spirit until it becomes part of us. So the life of Jesus must be ministered to us. The death of Jesus must be ministered to us, etc. Till eventually, his story becomes our story. And we are living in the story. It's interesting, the early Christians didn't call themselves Christians the non-Christians called them Christians. They called themselves the people of the way. Following the footsteps of Jesus in the way or the story of the kingdom. We are the people of the story. We are the people of the way. And all of the Christian life is part of that. And the church, this church, Victory Church, and Church of the Nations, and movements like that, we define ourselves as the representative new humanity that is reaching all of humanity so that there can come eventually a new heaven and a new earth. The very reason for our existence, we explain it because we are living in the story. So Jesus says this is what we are supposed to do. He says you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. To be a witness is to tell the story. And so Jesus does that, remember that remarkable journey on the way to Emmaus where he gave them a Bible study all day, and it says that he told them in the three major divisions of the whole of the Old Testament. This is how the Jews used to break up the Old Testament in the time of Jesus. In the law, which is the, all the Mosaic books, 
in the prophets, which is actually was their historical books and the prophets, and in the Psalms, which is the Psalms and the wisdom literature, those are the three categories of the whole of the Bible. And Jesus basically said, the whole story of Israel is what we are supposed to bear witness to. And that is the story that I've been explaining to you. So Jesus was into narrative theology. He was into explaining the kingdom of God. That's what it means to be a witness. So we're not at liberty to just have any story. He says, you are witnesses of these things. These things, the way the kingdom has come, the way the kingdom has come in Jesus at the fulfillment of the whole Old Testament story of the kingdom that builds, it's a very specific thing. He says, go and preach this message, the kingdom of God is at hand. Not any old message that we've warmed up. You know what I mean? It's a specific commission Jesus gave us. So in the next few days, in the morning with the GAP students, I'm going to be going along the book demonstrating the kingdom. And that is all about two major things. That Jesus gave his authority to his disciples. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go. And so, what does it mean to minister under his delegated authority to preach and teach the kingdom of God as he taught it? So that's the one major thing. But he didn't just give us authority, he also gave us power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And so, that's the big question. What is Pentecost? What does it mean to be empowered by the Holy Spirit or baptized in the Holy Spirit or filled with the Holy Spirit? And unless we have the power, we won't execute the authority. We need power and authority. So that takes us into the whole subject of the gifts of the Spirit, receiving in the beginning the baptism of the Spirit and then operating in the gifts of the Spirit. And then as we reach the world, we are the new humanity. And the whole topic of what does it mean to have a new identity in Jesus Christ? Um, the hottest topic today in our sad Western world is identity. People are trying to self-identify, sexually identify, all sorts of ways to identify. And, and there's a terrible need that people feel, especially young people feel today, to, to find their identity. Well, we've got a message of identity, of being a new person in Jesus Christ, see, that we take into the sad world. And so there's a whole section, I'm going to be two, doing two sessions on the whole thing of new identity in Jesus, the identity of the kingdom of God. And so in this diagram I've been going through with you, it's this but here, how do we go from Jesus to the authority and the power that he delegated to the 12, to the 70, to the church, and therefore to us today? And that's what I'm going to be going through in the mornings. Then in the evenings, I want to talk about essentially the gospel. And I want to just show you some statistics. And I'm sure you could find more up-to-date statistics. What I'm going to call Pentecostal charismatic Christianity, basically the part of the church that believes the gifts of the Spirit are for today. They didn't die out with the apostles. In 1980, represented 6% of global Christianity. That means the Orthodox, the Catholics, the Protestant, the whole body of Christ added together. But by 19. 80, we represented 25% of the whole. By 1992, the numbers of Pentecostals and Charismatics had grown to over 410 million and now comprise 24.2% of world Christianity. This is uh, Ralph Martin. My research has led me to make a bold statement. In all of human history, no other non-political, non-militaristic, voluntary human movement has grown as rapidly as the Pentecostal charismatic movement in the last 25 years. We are a plague taking over the church. All right? Um, 
another statistic. Today, one in four Christians in the world identifies as Pentecostal or charismatic, with Pentecostalism growing at roughly four times the rate of the world's population itself. So you just look at the stats in Africa, in South America, in Asia, South Korea, and now the Chinese underground church, growing faster than any other part of Christianity in the whole of the last 2,000 years of church history. So the question is, why would one brand of Christianity not only be growing relative to the rest of Christianity, but even relative to the world population, while other types of Christianity are really shrinking, especially in the Western world? This is the answer, the full gospel of the kingdom of God. You see, if we don't preach the gospel the way Jesus handed it over to us, we have a powerless witness. And so we need to be clear with what the gospel is that we preach. So it isn't just that he gave us authority and power, but he gave us a message to carry with that authority and power. And so one of the things I'm going to be dealing with is what has happened to the gospel and what is the difference between the full gospel of the kingdom and a reduced gospel? And so in the book there called Atonement and the Kingdom and my big fat, but fat one called The Kingdom Reformation, I, I spent a lot of time dealing with the long word for it is reductionism, how in the Protestant Western world the gospel has been shrunk down to less than the full gospel. Um, and so we need to discern what has gone wrong with the gospel in predominant evangelical Protestantism in the world today. And there is something that's gone wrong with the gospel. And we can be in danger of unconsciously inheriting the gospel. That's not the whole gospel. So we need to be clear about that. And part of that is discerning what one friend of mine who's a charismatic Methodist in Johannesburg has called the missing Jesus. So in a lot of the gospel, it goes, God made man, man fell. The answer is Jesus died. Find Jesus and go to heaven. And the whole story of Jesus doing signs and wonders and exorcisms and healing and ministering to the poor is left out. Now, you cannot be serious if you're saying we preach the gospel if you leave Jesus out. His ministry. See? And unfortunately, that's what's happened. So, N.T. Wright, who's one of the top theologians in the world today who writes about the kingdom, he says even the historic creeds have this problem. If you're old enough to be able to recite the creeds with me, you know, it goes like this. Um, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, now follow this, comma, crucified and died and rose again. Well, what happened to Jesus? So it's not that anything the creed says is wrong. The problem is, is what's missing in the creeds. And so the whole rediscovery of the kingdom of God shows us today, we can't do that. We have to include the ministry of Jesus and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Also, one of the things, if you read that, if you look at that whole narrative, is when there's a new humanity, there can come a new creation. And it's interesting that if you listen and talk to the millennial generation, they are much more concerned about the environment than old toppies generally like I am, who grew up in a world where there was nothing wrong with the globe. And so we need to be able to sh show how the whole picture of the kingdom of God uh, gives us an understanding of Christians and the environment, or what I call green Christians. We need to be green Christians, and we, we need to know why our calling for the environment is not the same as New Age uh, understandings, but there's a kingdom understanding of our call. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but I'm going to sort of tag that on. 
And we need to therefore understand the whole idea of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, to, to be people of the way. So these are the things I'm going to be doing in the evenings. And going back to my diagram, the transition from Jesus to us is not just about authority and power, but also what is the gospel we preach? What is the gospel of the kingdom? So we try and really define that. And how as we progress in world missions and take the gospel to every nation until the end of the age, how we are part of that gigantic plan till eventually there will be a new heaven and a new earth. So I'm just trying to psych you up to come on Monday. All right, and uh, all I can say is, see you then. Okay. <laughs>